continuing going through what you need to know before joining our church. And we're still in the section of our beliefs. And this today is going to be kind of a smorgasbord of a bunch of different stuff that are completely unrelated to each other. But that's kind of the nature of these. And we're just going through different things and kind of jumping from topic to topic. And the first one that I want to get to is on page 11, if you have the outline. It's number 14, and it is the names of God. And this isn't something that we talk about a whole lot. I don't preach on this a whole lot. And I have, but I have included it because as I've been posting videos out there on the internet over the last five years, I've found that there are, I don't know how many percentage wise of, of Christians out there, but there are plenty of people that profess to be Christians that subscribe to what is called the Hebrew roots movement, where they believe that we should refer to God by his Hebrew names and that, that the name of Jesus shouldn't be in the Bible, and that's not really God's name or Jesus' name, and so on. You've probably heard some of these names before, and I'll, I'll get to them here in a minute. And so the, the, the reason that I'm covering this now is to show you why we call God what we call him, because that is his name in the Bible, and that um, we don't call him by these other names that are not found in the King James Bible. So, like I said, God's names are found in the King James. We're English reading, English speaking people. So, we just the most simple basic fact is we should call God what the Bible calls God. If God's name is given in the King James, then that's what we should call him. And we shouldn't be, as English speakers, be calling him by a name in another language that we don't speak. We don't call him Jesus or something. That's how Spanish people pronounce the name of Jesus. We don't call him that. We call him Jesus because we're English-speaking people, and that's what the Bible calls him. And really, this issue, it comes down to a Bible version issue, because if you believe the King James is the Word of God, like we do, then you call God what's in the King James. And I guess if you don't read the King James, then, you know, we go back to the very beginning of this study, and that's the Bible that we read. And if if you don't believe the King James is the Word of God, then this, this probably wouldn't be the church for you, I suppose. But anyway, let me just give you some examples of God's names in the Bible. And there are a whole bunch of them, so I'm not going to get through all of them, but I'll give you some of the main names that we refer to God by. Uh, the first one would be God, right? Genesis 1.1, and I can probably go to about 10,000 verses to, for an example of this, but Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There are actually people out there, that, and it's like this, um, this Jewish... Um, what's the superstition where they can't they believe they can't speak the name of god so they will write the name of god god by g dash d like you can't say his name or something or even spell it and you'll see that out there there's i've had a cousin that was into this stuff one time then another name for god is lord all in caps and there's numerous examples but if you just turn over a couple of pages to genesis chapter 4 and verse 1 it says an abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord, see all there in all caps, had respect unto Abel and to his offering. In the King James, there's a reason why they put Lord in all caps there, because that is the translation of God's name of Jehovah. In, in the Hebrew, it is Y-H-W-H. That's how the name of Jehovah is spelled in the Hebrew. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But that you'll find that name, L, capital L-O-R-D, I think 6,000 and some times in the Bible. It's used uh, many times in the Old Testament. Then you have God's name Jehovah in Exodus 6 and verse 3. Jehovah is not used very many times in the King James. It is translated, I believe it's six times. I'd have to look back to make sure about that. It's either six or eight. I'm pretty sure it's six. But if you look in the book of Exodus, chapter 6 and verse 3, this is one of the places where God gives his name Jehovah. That's why I read this passage this morning in the call to worship. The Lord says in Exodus 6 and verse 3, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. So there's another name of God, God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So he didn't reveal the name of Jehovah to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for whatever reason. Reasons known only to God, I suppose. But he didn't... um, appear unto them, at least, by that name, as he says. He was not known to them by that name. He was known to them by the name of God Almighty. This is one of the six places where Jehovah is used in the King James. 
that same word Jehovah there is translated, or that word Jehovah is translated from the same name that L-O-R-D is in the Old Testament. Then you have Lord with just capital L and then lowercase O-R-D in Matthew 4 and verse 7 is an example of that. Nothing wrong with calling God Lord. There are people out there that, that um, they, they think that that's uh, maligning God's name to call him Lord. And they have various reasons for that. Um, Matthew 4 and verse 7. It says, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then you have the Almighty. Um, this is used both in the Old and New Testament. Job 5 and verse 17 is an example of this. Job 5 and verse 17. Any of these names uh, are perfectly accept- acceptable to call God by. Job 5 and verse 17. It says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. There's one of his names. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. So right there, that defines <clears throat> the Almighty as God. God and the Almighty are, are both names for the God of heaven. Jesus Christ is likewise called the Almighty. I won't take you there, but it's in Revelation 1. I think it's in verse 13, or verse could be verse 8, um, where Jesus is called the, the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty. And then God, of course, is called Father. Just an example of this would be 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5 and verse 7. This is the verse where we get the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity from. It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So there's three names for God because God is three persons. The Father is the first person. The Word is the second person. Uh, the Holy Ghost is the third person of the Trinity. Those are all names of God. And another name, which I don't have on here, would be the highest, because we're told that whenever Jesus Christ was conceived, it says that the power of the highest would overshadow thee, or would come upon thee, and the, the Holy Ghost would come up. up how, how did it say that there? Um, I get, I'm getting the two of those things mixed up. In Luke 1, let me just get that, Luke 1 and verse 35. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. So the highest is another name for God, for the, the first person of the Trinity. And then, of course, probably the most important name is the name of Jesus. If you look in Matthew 1 and verse 21, there are actually people out there that say the name of Jesus means a pig or something like that. Like they, they I mean, and these are Christian, supposed Christian professing people, and they literally despise the name of Jesus. They say that that name should not be in the Bible, that is not his name, it means a pig or something. It's ridiculous. Anyway, Matthew 1 and verse 21. I know it sounds crazy to you when you've never heard it. That Just think of anything you could possibly think of, the weirdest, craziest thing, and there is somebody out there that believes it and probably has a blog about it or something. It's, you just wouldn't believe the stuff that's out there. Strange and diverse doctrines. Anyway, Matthew one twenty one, And this is the angel telling uh, Joseph that Mary, his wife, or his espoused wife, would conceive, being a virgin, and bring forth a son. And it says, and she shall, call, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's his name. That is the second person of the Trinity made flesh. It's his name. His name is Jesus. Now, I want to cover something that I covered in a, in a video blog a long time ago, and you might not even remember this. And this is kind of, I think this is an important point. It's a little bit... It's slightly difficult, but it's not horribly difficult, so I think I should be able to, to make it plain enough for you here. And that is the issue when I was talking about that the King James translators translated the name of God in Hebrew, the YHWH name. They translated that as Lord most of the time in the Old Testament. Like thousands of times they translated it in, in all caps, L-O-R-D, and then just a few times as Jehovah. And why would that be? So why wouldn't they just translate the name Jehovah in Hebrew as Jehovah in English. Why, why wouldn't they do that? Why did they do it as Lord most of the time? And the word, so in, in Hebrew, the Y is pronounced as a J in English. 
So you got Y H W H, and the and the sometimes people also pronounce it or spell it Y H V H. So the V, the W is pronounced as a V. So when you get J H Y pronounces J and W pronounced as V, and then in the Hebrew, I'm no Hebrew expert by any stretch, but you don't have vowels in Hebrew. You only have consonants, and generally there are vowels between each consonant. They're not written; they're they're pronounced. And so here you have four letters, which means you'd have three vowels in between each one. And typically with a four-letter word, it's going to be a three-syllable word. Okay, so that's why the name is Jehovah, right? So if you put vowels in between there, and the Y is pronounced as a J, and the W is pronounced as a V, Jehovah. That's how you pronounce God's name. It's not Yahweh, right? Yahweh is two syllables, right? And even though there's a you know a W and a Y there, I think that's where people come up with Yahweh, but that's not God's name. You're not going to find Yahweh in the Bible, right? His name is Jehovah. But so the question is, why didn't the King James translators just put Jehovah in all those six thousand places? And here's the reason. The reason is because God Himself translated Jehovah, that Y H W H name, as Lord in the New Testament. This is really neat. Let me show you this. Jesus Christ himself, when he quoted from the law, he translated the name of God, Jehovah, Y-H-W-H, in the Hebrew. He translated it into Greek as Lord. Let me show you this. Matthew 22 and verse 37. Matthew 22, 37. I guess I'm just taking the opportunity to teach on this right now because I probably won't get back to it for a long time and I may as well cover it while, while I'm on the topic. Matthew 22 and verse 37. But I do think it's very important as well. It says here, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. The Lord thy God. That's capital L and then lowercase O-R-D. Now keep your finger there and turn back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And this is the passage that Jesus is quoting. So he's quoting the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6 and verse 5. And we'll see what he's quoting. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So same verse. Now notice in Deuteronomy 6, 5, Thou shalt love the Lord, and that's in all caps, right? So that's the name of Jehovah, right? If you had, if you were reading a Hebrew scroll, you'd see Y H W H there, right? Name of Jehovah. But notice what? Keep your finger there in Deuteronomy. Go back to Matthew, and he quotes it as "Love the Lord," capital L, lowercase O R D. Now, this is of course our King James is in English. But remember what Jesus was speaking whenever he spoke those words, and what Matthew wrote down, he was, Jesus was speaking Greek, Matthew was writing down Greek, right? So in the Greek, Jesus spoke and Matthew wrote down the Greek word Lord, right? Okay, so the Greek word Lord, I'm not like, I don't know any Greek, right? But the Greek word for Lord is kurios, kurios or kurios, however you pronounce that. But the point is, he didn't say Jehovah, right? I mean, they, he knew how to say the word Jehovah, and Matthew knew how to write the name Jehovah if he wanted to, right? I mean, they, that's what they called God, right? They called him Jehovah, or maybe as a Hebrew, Yehovah or something. But he could have written down Jehovah, but he didn't. He wrote down Lord, or the Greek equivalent of the English word Lord. So Jesus translated Jehovah as Lord. Right? Whenever he read, was reading out of the law, he read the name Jehovah, he said, Lord. You see that? God himself translated the Hebrew name Jehovah as Lord. You see, that's how God does it. Let me give you another example. Acts 4.26. I said it's slightly difficult because you're dealing in three different languages and, and we only speak one of those languages. But I think if you just get the idea, I, I think you get it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 26. The apostles did likewise. Here's the apostle Peter. And he says, Acts 4, 26. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Against the Lord. Right? Now go back to where that where he's quoting from, which is in Psalm 2 
in verse 2. Psalm 2 in verse 2. You know what I'm doing here? The Bible says that wisdom is justified of all her children. People will go to the Old Testament and say, those King James translators messed up. They should have translated YHWH as Jehovah because Jehovah is God's name. They should not have translated it Lord. They did that for whatever reason. They wanted to keep the name of God from us or something. They shouldn't have done it as Lord. And I'm justifying God's word by showing you that God translates Jehovah as Lord. And therefore, if the King James trans, the King James translators translate Jehovah as Lord, they're doing the exact same thing that God did through, the, through Jesus Christ and through the apostles whenever he wrote the New Testament. Okay, Acts, I'm sorry, uh, Psalm 2 in verse 2. Here's the verse that Peter's quoting. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, all in caps, that's Jehovah, and against his anointed, saying. So Peter, therefore, once again, he does the same thing that Jesus did. He quotes the name of Jehovah from the Old Testament. Because in, when, if Peter was reading, and he could read, he was a Jew, he could read Hebrew. If Peter was pulling out the scroll of Psalm 2, and he was reading that, Guess what? I, I couldn't read the rest of it. But when he got to the, right there, when it says against the, you know what he would have said? Jehovah. Jehovah. Right? That's what he would have read there. But when he quotes that, and he says it, and he writes it down, it's written down as Lord. Right? That's what he said. That's what, in this case, Luke would have written down, because Luke wrote the book of Acts. He writes it down as Lord, not as Jehovah. So the KJV translators were simply following the example of Jesus and the apostles who translated YHWH, or Jehovah, as Lord under the inspiration of God when they translated, when the King James translators translated YHWH as L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. So they were following the pattern, right? The pattern was that Jesus and the apostles translated Jehovah as Lord, from Hebrew to Greek in the New Testament. Now, the King James translators follow the same pattern in the vast majority of times. They translate Jehovah as Lord in the English in the Old Testament. You get it? They did the same thing. Jesus, the apostles, and the King James translators all translated the name Jehovah as Lord. Right? Jesus and the apostles did it from Hebrew to Greek. The King James translators did it from Hebrew to English. Right? Got it? I did a video on this. I probably just explained it better right now than in the video. So I get, you could look at the video, but I'm not sure that I, I said anything there that I didn't hear. But you could check that out if you want to. The, the link is in the outline. So God's name for English speakers is not Yahweh. It's not Elohim, right? That's the Hebrew word for God. It's not good, like G-D, like people. And you'll see this. I'm, I'm not making it up. It's not good. It's not Yeshua which is the Hebrew name for Jesus. It's not Yahshua, which is another Hebrew name for Jesus. It's not Yahushua, which I think is another name, Hebrew name for Jesus. It's not any of these things. It's not any name that's not found in the King James. God's name is what God says it is in the King James for us English speakers. Now, if you were a Hebrew-speaking Jew and you want to call Jesus Yahushua or Yeshua, or you want to call God Elohim, or you want to call him Yehovah, or, or you can call him Jehovah because Jehovah's in the Bible, right? But if you want to call him any of those names, then go ahead. If you're a Hebrew and you read Hebrew and you call God Hebrew names, then call him Hebrew names. But if you're an Englishman reading an English Bible, speaking English, then call him what God calls himself in the English, right? If God wanted English-speaking people to call him by those names, he would have put them in the King James, Right? He could have put any of those names in the King James. If he wanted to call Jesus Yeshua, he would have written, written Yeshua in the King James. Right? It's, 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 that, it's that simple. So we call him what the Bible calls him. So I belabored the point a lot, but it irritates me to no end. Because basically what they're doing is they're saying, God's word is wrong. This is God, Yeshua is his real name. Jesus means a pig or something. The Bible's wrong, and you ought to call him some other name. I don't like that. Okay, now let's totally switch gears from the sublime to the ridiculous. 
and let's talk about the flat earth of all things. And I've included the flat earth, and I am not going to elaborate on this because I could elaborate for hours because I have done a lot. I've watched a lot of videos, both pro and con. I have read a 600 and some page book on the flat earth, pro flat earth, by a guy named Edward Hendry. I'm within just a few pages of the end of it. I'm in the last chapter. So I am pretty well versed on the flat earth. Okay, I'm not an expert by any means, but I probably know more about it than the average Joe, and that would be, you know, the average Joe doesn't know anything about it. So anyway, I know enough about it to speak about it. Let me put it that way. And I could speak on it for hours at this point because it is something that I've taken an interest in because unfortunately there are Christians out there, I, I even know people of like faith, that have bought into the flat earth thing. And so I want to include this. And the thing is, it's very prevalent on the internet. It's all over the place. And a lot of people that have commented on my YouTube videos that, that agree with us on a lot of stuff turn out to be flat earthers. People that followed me and really liked what I had to say until I came out against the flat earth and then phew, they were done with me. Once you, I mean, it's, it's a big thing out there. So let me just say it unequivocally, we are not flat earthers, okay? We don't believe the earth is flat. And if that's your thing, if you want to be a member of the church and you believe the earth is flat and you just want to kind of keep that to yourself, okay, that's fine. But no flat earth proselytizers here. We are, this is not going to be an area of contention. We are not, this, is not, this does not define our church or anything. So that's why I've included it because the movement is really, really uh, growing. Let me just give you a couple of proofs that the earth is not flat. And I, you can see the sermon that I, I gave you a whole ton of them. But Isaiah 40 and verse 22 shows us that the earth is a globe. Now I realize the flat earthers will go to Isaiah 40, 22 and say, see, this verse says that the earth is flat. But the earth, this verse does not say the earth is flat. And if you get out a dictionary and just define the words with an, in, with an OED, you'll find out that this verse is saying that the earth is a sphere. Isaiah 40 and verse 22. <clears throat> it says, He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Right Now, I've long time, for many, many years, used this as a proof that the Bible was true. Before I even knew, I never even heard of the flat earth, except I heard some, you know, some myth of some ancient people believed in it, and I don't even know if that, that myth is, I don't even know if ancient people believe the earth was flat, but anyway, I had used this for a long time, so probably since I was a kid and watched a Kent Hovind video or something, that, hey, this verse shows that the Bible, or the Bible's true because this verse says before people could, could view the earth from outer space, or whatever, this verse shows us that the earth is a globe, right? Well, then the flat earthers come along and they say, it says that the earth is a circle. See, that's flat. A circle's flat. This is not a proof that the earth is flat. A circle is a two-dimensional object, right? So whether the earth is a pancake or it's a ball, either one, it is not a circle by definition, right? A circle is a two-dimensional object, right? A circle has no thickness, right? A circle is a line that has equidistant, uh, uh, equidistant, diameter from a center point, basically, okay? That's what, it's a geometric object. It's not even a physical thing. So, the, this verse does not prove that the earth is flat, but notice what it says. It says that he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, right? That's a phrase, circle of the earth. I'm going to define that for you in just a second. Let me just define circle for you. A circle is a perfectly round, plain figure. In geometry, defined as a plane figure bounded by a single curved line called the circumference, which is everywhere equally distant from a point within called the center. Okay, everybody knows what a circle is. But often, but often applied to the circumference alone without the included space. Now, when we're talking about um, a nautical definition, like when you're talking about sailing ships, it is great circle sailing, navigation along the arc of a great circle of the earth, right? There's that phrase, circle of the earth. Now, let me define the word equator for you. And we're going to see this same exact phrase, circle of the earth. Equator, when we're talking about a geographic definition, 
Number two, equator is a great circle of the Earth in the plane of the celestial equator and equidistant from the two poles. A similarly situated circle, this is the next definition, a similar, similarly situated circle on any heavenly or occasional any spherical body. You see, the circle of the earth is the equator of the earth. It is a circle around a spherical body. So any circumference of the earth is the, quote, circle of the earth. That phrase is can only be applied to a sphere, right? That's what circle of the earth means. It's the equator, in other words. Next, you have a verse that tells us that the earth hangs upon nothing in empty space. So that verse there in Isaiah 40, 22 does not prove that the earth is flat at all. It proves that the earth is a sphere because the circle of the earth is the equator. It's the, the circumference of a sphere, of a spherical body. Next, you have Job 26 and verse 7, which says that the earth is hung upon nothing in empty space. I'm doing this for your benefit. Anybody listening to this as a flat earther is, is this is not going to convince them that, you know, probably with most of them, nothing will convince them. There are a few people that are still open minded that have, you know, looked into it and been been convinced or somewhat convinced by the flat earth. But they're also open to looking at contrary views and evidence. But unfortunately, a lot of flat earthers that, that I've met online are just closed minded, deluded. Uh, brainwashed people. It's just, it's like dealing with somebody in a cult. You just can't, it doesn't matter what you told them. You could make yourself a spaceship and go into outer space and, and take them with you and they'd probably say that they're looking at a mirage or something. I mean, it's just it, it, nothing, but nothing would convince them. But th not everybody's that way, but there are plenty of them. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. Really strange. Job 26 and verse 7. Because when, when I was studying this stuff out, I thought, you know, I just want to prove this once and for all. I should just buy myself a plane ticket down to Buenos Aires, Chile, and then get a plane ticket from Buenos Aires, Chile, over to um, Brisbane or wherever it was in, in um, Australia. It wasn't Brisbane, Melbourne, I think it was. And just get a, get a plane ticket straight from Chile to uh, a direct flight. Chile to Australia, which you can you could go online. I mean, they sell them every day. It takes like 14 hours, which is absolutely impossible on a flat earth because on the flat earth, Australia and South America are on complete opposite ends of the earth. And it'd be a, you know, I don't even know how many thousands of miles it would be. But anyway, you couldn't make a direct flight with that. And I thought, you know what? That's what I do. Make a nice little vacation. Fly to Chile, fly to Australia, come back home and tell everybody, hey, I did it. Took 12 hours, direct flight. The earth is the shape that, that we all know it is. But you know what they'd say? You're lying. You're a shill. I've seen your little Masonic symbols or whatever. You're a Mason. You're a Cla You know, it wouldn't matter. I mean, it wouldn't matter what I did. So I can't afford to take a trip like that anyway. But if I could, it'd be fun. But I'm certainly not going to do it just so people can call me a liar. Anyway, Job 26 and verse 7. It says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. It's not on four physical pillars or something like that, like the flat earthers say. It is hung. It's in the empty place. He stretches the north over the empty place, and he hangs the earth on nothing. It's just sitting there in outer space, suspended upon nothing. That's what it is. Anyway, you can see the sermons on flat earth refutation there at excelsiorspringschurch.com slash flat earth refutation with dashes in between it. I really believe that this whole thing is a deception designed to make Christians look stupid because a lot of Christians have bought into this thing. And if they can get you to buy into the flat earth conspiracy thing, then they can make you look dumb and they can uh, just dismiss anything else you have to say about maybe any other actual real conspiracies out there. It's, it's, a, it's quite the ploy to make us all look stupid. Anyway, okay, now on to yet another topic, which is totally different, and that is pagan holidays. So we've got the holidays of Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, which are basically Christianized pagan holidays. By pagan, I mean like earth-worshipping, nature-worshipping, idol-worshipping people. People, mostly it would be prior to Christianity. There are still pagan people out there today, 
but most of them would be, you know, most of the people of the world are involved in some kind of a, of a religion that I wouldn't really call pagan. It would be, you know, whether it's Islam or Judaism or something else. Um, but back in the pre-Christian days, there were a lot of just earth-worshipping, idol-worshipping, devil-worshipping, you know, people out there. And they had their holidays. And um, one of those holidays was what we now call Christmas. Christmas was the Catholic name given to the pagan holiday of Natalis Solus Invicti, which is a word that translates the birth of the unconquered sun. And they celebrated the birthday of the sun a few days after the winter solstice. The winter solstice is in December, December 21st. And you would notice in the northern hemisphere that as the days get closer, as we go from June to December, the days continually get shorter. You notice that it gets, it's getting darker out earlier now. By the time we get to December 21st, it's going to be dark at you know, 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon, and it doesn't get daylight again until 8 o'clock in the morning or something like that. So we have really short days. So the, the length of the nights is far longer than the length of the days. So it appeared to these people as they're watching the, the heavens and they're, they're observing the seasons that they see, boy, it looks like the sun has died, right? The sun has continually been losing its strength from June until December. And December 21st, the sun's dead. It's at its weakest point throughout the year. And then a few days later, you notice that this, the days start to become longer again. It's like the sun has been reborn, right? The birth of the unconquered sun. The sun hasn't been conquered after all. He's still going strong. He's coming back from the dead, as it were, right? So they, they had a celebration of that, that the, the sun's cycle is renewed again. The sun has been reborn. Well, then along comes the Catholic Church. And in about 3, I think it was 325 AD, the Catholic Church decides that we're going to make this holiday of Natalis Solus Invicti, or it was also, there was another holiday right around the same time of year called Saturnalia, which was a longer festival of, I think it was a week or two, um, right at the end of December there. We will take these holidays and we will bring them into Catholicism, we'll Catholicize them, and we'll call it Christmas, right? Christ's Mass. So instead of celebrating the birthday of the sun in the sky, we'll celebrate the birthday of the Son of God, right? And because after all, I mean, it kind of, you know, he died and he resurrected and he was so, you know, kind of roughly fits, I suppose. So we just bring in this pagan holiday and call it Christ's Mass. And it'll be celebrating the birthday of Jesus instead of the birthday of the Son. Then you have Easter. Easter is the Catholic name given to the pagan fertility holiday of Ishtar or Astarte or Istra. Those are three names for the same pagan festivals. They were festivals that uh, celebrated the renewal of life, right? Uh, fertility. They, were, they took place around the spring equinox. So the spring of the year, everything is blooming, all the animals are mating, it's, life is, is, um, is uh, coming about again. And we, they celebrated this, this um, what, what they believed were the gods mating in the sky, right? You had Baal and Astarte or Ishtar, the male god and the female god, and they were mating and causing spring to come about on earth. So that's the origin of Easter. So the, the Catholic Church once again just said, hey, we'll just take this fertility worship stuff at the equinox and we'll bring that into Catholicism, and we'll call it Easter, and it'll be about the resurrection of Christ, which is, you know, kind of a renewal of life kind of thing, right? So we'll, we'll make that all fit, and just basically keep the same stuff. You know, the, the, the eggs and the Easter bunnies, right? Bunnies are a symbol of fertility, right? Rabbits breed, I don't know how many times a year, you probably know, but they breed like crazy. They breed like rabbits, right, as they say. And so they're a sign of fertility. Eggs are a sign of fertility, Look at chickens. I mean, they can reproduce themselves 365 times a year, right? I mean, they're, they're putting out eggs constantly. So eggs and rabbits are fertility signs. And I don't know how, how you get rabbits laying eggs with the Easter bunny and all that. That's, that's bizarre. But anyway, you kind of get an amalgamation of these things together. So, you know, people are like, oh, you know, I, I, celebrate, I celebrate the true meaning of Easter. But, you know, I, I hate this pagan stuff like the rabbits and the, and the eggs and everything. No, no, no. If you want to celebrate Easter, celebrate the rabbits and the eggs. That's really the Easter thing. Leave Jesus out of it. He was never in it in the first place. Get, get the rabbits and the eggs. 
If you want to celebrate Christmas, do it with Santa Claus. Don't do it with Jesus, because Jesus was never in there in the first place. Santa Claus is, should be kept in Christmas. And then you got East, or you got Halloween, which is the uh, the other one. This was the Catholic name given to the pagan Druidic celebration of uh, Samhain or Sowin. Now, in the outline, if you see that, you read the the if you try to read it phonetically, you'd think it would be pronounced Samhain. But if you pronounce it Samhain like I used to, you're going to look like a dummy to somebody that actually knows what they're talking about here. So if you say Samhain, you have revealed your ignorance. So it's Sawin or Sowin is how that's pronounced. Now anyway, so, the, so Halloween is the Catholic name given to the Druidic. That's like uh, Irish, the Irish Celts. The, their, the ancient religion there was Druidism, which is you know basically like devil worship. Uh, <clears throat> occultic stuff. So it's the pagan druidic celebration of Sowin, where evil spirits were appeased uh, by giving them food on October 31st. Because if I'm remembering the history right, November 1st was the new year, the uh, druidic new year. October 31st was the last day of the year, and this was the day that the evil spirits would come back. And to um, this is like the, the peak period of the dead, um, in, in that culture, as they thought. So in order to keep the evil spirits from coming back, they would offer them food to appease them. Trick or treat, right? You know, kids come dressed up as witches and goblins and ghosts and that kind of thing. They come to the door and you give them candy to appease them, right? So that's, that's the origin of that. Any encyclopedia will verify these facts. So you don't have to take my word for it. Just go read the Britannica or read the World Book Encyclopedia or whatever. Um, they'll, they'll all tell you this stuff. Go on Wikipedia. Wikipedia will, will tell you this stuff as well. And you can get the short condensed version if you, if you check out the outlines I have on these uh, three holidays. You can get that at ExcelsiorSpringsChurch.com slash holidays. But the, so what's the problem with this? Okay, so the Catholic Church brought all these pagan peoples in there that would have been devil worshipers, and they brought them into Catholicism, which is kind of like Christianity. Not exactly, but you know, in, in some people's minds anyway, it's better than devil worship anyway. So they bring them into the Catholic Church, and they you know, just kind of change their customs around and, and make them Christian. So whereas they used to be celebrating fertility and, and that kind of thing, and celebrating you know, worshiping the sun, so we'll just bring them into Catholicism, and, and just change those things around a little bit. And now they're going to be Christians and they're celebrating the birth of Christ and the death of Christ and Halloween. I don't know what, I don't know what exactly. Oh, the all, the all saints, the, the um, all hallows Eve. So we're remembering the, the saints that have passed on, right? So we're remembering the dead. So, so it's a good thing, right? We're, 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 we're making them Christians and bringing it all in and just, you know, just got to tweak a little bit, change the names and everything's good. And so we got a bunch of people that were devil worshipers and now they're quote-unquote Christians, right? The problem is that God doesn't like that kind of thing. He doesn't want pagan stuff brought into his religion and the names changed or anything else. He wants the pagan stuff left out there in paganism. Let me give you a verse for that. Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. This is when Israel was going into the land of Canaan. So the Lord had delivered them from Egypt, and they had wandered around out there in the wilderness for 40 years. And they're getting ready to go into the land, and God is giving them a warning that the people in this land are a bunch of devil worshipers. They're a bunch of idolaters. And if you go in there and you get curious and you say, hmm, how did they worship their gods? And well, that's, that's kind of neat. I kind of like that. You know, maybe God would like that too. And then you start worshiping me, God says, like the way that they worship their gods. Don't do that. Don't do that because I don't, I hate the way that they worship their gods. I do not want to be worshiped the way they worship their gods. This is his warning to them. Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. It says, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Look at this, very simple. Single syllable words. God wants it to be really plain. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. There's only one two-syllable word 
in that whole sentence, and it's the word unto, which is a pretty easy word. So God uses single syllable words to make it plain. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters have they burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. God says, don't look at the way that they worship their gods and say, I'll do that likewise. I will worship my God the way they worship their gods. God says, thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. Because what they do is an abomination to God. An abomination is a feeling of combined disgust and hatred. God hates the religion of pagan peoples. He hates devil worship. He hates idolatry. He hates all those things. And he says, don't bring that into my religion. Don't try to Christianize that, right? And bring that to me. I don't want it. And then he says in verse 32, whatever I tell you to do, do it. Whatsoever I command you observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto or diminish that from it. So you don't add anything to it. And you say, well, you know, we could just bring in you know, Saturnalia and call it Christmas and, because we should celebrate the birth of Christ anyway, right? I mean, shouldn't we celebrate the birth of Christ? Surely God wants us to celebrate the birth of Christ. Did God ever tell you to celebrate the birth of Christ? Read through the Bible. Read through the New Testament. Does he one time ever tell us to celebrate the birth of Christ? He doesn't. It's not there. You have a record of the birth of Christ, and then you have a record of, of the wise men coming like two years later and giving gifts to Jesus himself, but show me in the Bible where anybody ever celebrated the birth of Christ. Never. Jesus himself never did it. We don't read of Mary and Joseph even doing it for that matter. The apostles never did it. They never commanded any of us to do it. God says, whatsoever I command you to do, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish that from it. If he wanted us to celebrate the birth of Christ, he would have told us to celebrate the birth of Christ. And furthermore, he would have told us when Jesus was born and when we ought to do it. You know, we're not told when Jesus was born. You can pretty well figure it out, and I've, I've preached on this before, that he was born in September. Definitely not born in December. That's a fact. You know, there, there's no biblical evidence for that whatsoever. So he wasn't even born in December. So God says, do what I tell you. Don't add anything to it. Don't bring in paganism to my religion. Let's look at Jer- Jeremiah 10 and verse 2 through 4. Jeremiah 10, 2 through 4. This might sound familiar to you if, you if you think about it. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Look at this. God says, don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven. Like when you look up and you notice that the days are becoming shorter throughout the year and it looks like the sun is at its weakest point and then later on, then the sun starts to regain its strength and you look at that and you conclude, oh, the sun died, the sun is reborn, the sun is God, the sun brings light and warmth to the earth, right? The sun is the sun is, is the source of our being and it's died and it's resurrected again and we're going to celebrate this, right? Don't look at the signs of heaven and be dismayed at them. And then look at what's connected with that. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. These people went out there in the forest and they cut down a tree with an axe. And then what do they do with that tree? They deck it. Verse 4. They deck it. To deck means to decorate. Right? Remember the old Christmas song, Deck the Halls with Boughs of Holly? Decorate the Halls? By the way, holly is another pagan sign of fertility. That's why holly is used at Christmas time. The wreaths pagan sign of fertility, so on. They deck it, they decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. Now, this is referring to making an idol. You read verse 5, they are talking about making an idol, right? But what would also fall under the condemnation of this passage? You go out into the forest and you cut down a tree with an axe and you bring it into your house and you fasten it down with hammers and nails so it doesn't fall over, 
right? Make sure it stands up. And then you decorate it with silver and gold. Have you ever seen silver and gold tinsel, right? I mean, they literally cut a tree out of the forest. They bring it into the house. They fasten it so it doesn't fall over. And then they decorate it with silver and gold. That's, wow, that's a Christmas tree, right? I mean, is he talking about a Christmas tree here? He's talking about an idol. But does a Christmas tree fall under that description? Yes. Does it fall under that condemnation? Yes, it does. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. It says, be, not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's the devil. And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel is an unbeliever. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Paul says to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, let's just look at this in the context of Christmas or Easter or Halloween. Let's just do Christmas. So, look back in history, 325 A.D., what did the Catholics, when the Catholic Church is just basically getting off the ground there. I mean, it was when, whenever the Christian Church was kind of morphing into the or some of the Christian churches were morphing into the Catholic Church, basically around that time. It was a, it was a transitional period, and that's pretty much whenever it became the, the official state religion of the Roman Empire and so on. And right around that time is when Christmas was brought in. It was all the same time. So here you have Christians, we'll just call them, you know, in error, but we'll just say roughly Christians at that time. We'll just call it that. And you got these pagan people that are worshiping the sun, celebrating Saturnalia, Natus, Solus, and Victi, those type of, of sun-worshiping holidays. And what do they do? They bring them into the Christian faith, right? They yoke themselves up together with them, but they're unequally yoked because these people are still pagans, right? You've just brought their paganism into the church, changed the names around a bit, but they're still celebrating the same old paganism. They're doing the exact same thing they've always been doing. They're just calling it by a different name. They have unequally yoked themselves together with unbelievers. You see, they're not, they're not supposed to do that. Neither are we. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? I mean, we're, not supposed to link, we're not supposed to be matched up with this kind of false religion. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? I mean, that Christmas tree falls under an idol, right? In Jeremiah 10, that thing, I mean, it's, it's, it's under the same condemnation as an idol. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? God says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. God doesn't want that stuff brought into his religion. These pagan holidays, believe it or not, honor devils. That's what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 20. 1 Corinthians 10.20 <clears throat> Because they clearly were not honoring Jesus Christ before the names were changed. right? They were, these were devil-worshipping holidays. And I'll prove it to you. 1 Corinthians 10.20 But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You see, the Gentiles were referring to the people you know, out there uh, in that were outside of the Christian church and that were outside of the nation of Israel prior to the Christian church, right? The people of the other nations, the Gentiles, when they made sacrifices, when they had their religious observances, they were doing so to devils. Now, did they know that they were doing it to devils? I don't know. But who were the, the gods behind all those religions? It's devils, right? Devils were the gods, the, the Zeuses and the Thors and all those false gods that, that those Gentiles worshipped. Those were devils. Paul says we can't have fellowship with devils. Now the thing is, if it was devil worship before the name was changed, what is it after the name's changed? If worshipping the sun, sun worship, I think everybody would, would conclude, 
and, and the sun, Baal is is the embodiment of the sun, basically. He's like the sun god. If if worshiping the sun is worshiping Baal or worshiping the devil, and then you change the name of it and call it Christmas, what is it? Right? If it's devil worship before the name's changed, what is it after the name's changed? When it's the name, not the substance, is changed, right? Same thing. We must worship God in the manner in which he commands and not diminish anything from it. Look at Matthew 28 and verse 20. Matthew 28, 20. Jesus says, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He's supposed to go out, baptize, teach all nations. And here's what he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And that little statement there, encompasses so much because when he says to teach them to observe all things that means we can't leave anything out right all things means everything nothing accepted whatsoever i've commanded you means in particular whatsoever the things that i've specifically told you to do do so do all of them and only the things that i tell you to do right we can't add things in and take things away Paul commended the church at Corinth for keeping the ordinances as he had delivered them. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2. He said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Do it the way that Paul, through the inspiration of God, said. <clears throat> Paul never commanded the observance of Christmas, Easter, Halloween. As a matter of fact, Paul condemned the observance of those things. Remember the Christians there? I'll give you another verse. The Christians, because Halloween's coming up here. In uh, Acts, I think it was chapter 18 in Ephesus, when those people were converted, 19, Acts 19, when they were converted, these people were into occultic devil worship, witchcraft, that kind of stuff, evil things. And when they were converted, they renounced that stuff. They didn't bring it into God's religion and change the name of it, right? Can you imagine that? Imagine if you were a witch and you were doing spells or something, calling up the dead or doing some evil, wicked thing, right, by evil spirits. And then you're converted to be a Christian and you just say, well, now I'm just going to do this in the name of Jesus. Just think about that, right? I'll just do it in the name of Jesus. I'll just say, in the name of Jesus, uh, my dead lost relative, come up from the dead and talk to me or whatever, right? It's still devil worship, even if you're doing it in the name of Jesus, right? Just because you change the name of it doesn't change the substance of it. So in Acts 19, when they were converted, look what happened here. Acts 19 and verse 18 It says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which use curious arts, that's like that witchcraft type of stuff, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. They burned 50,000 pieces of silver worth of books. That's a lot of money. Even if those... I mean, $50,000 worth of books is a lot of money, even if each piece of silver is worth a buck, right? But chances are a piece of silver is worth more than a buck. So you have a lot, maybe $100,000, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of books. And in those days, books are precious things, right? They're, they're hand copied, right? And, and they got rid of them. They didn't say, okay, I'm a Christian now. I'm going to take them down to the used bookstore and sell them to some other witch, right? No, get rid of them. Renounce that stuff. And then look at the result. When God's people didn't bring paganism into his religion, but left it out and destroyed it, then look what happens. Verse 20, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Because they destroyed their former 
wicked religion. The word of God mightily grew and prevailed. Why is the word of God not growing and prevailing in this country now? Probably many reasons. But it's, I'm sure one of the reasons is because God's people are given to idolatry. Right? There was a time, you know, this, I don't think a lot of people even realize this. There was a time in this country where Christmas was not celebrated. Like before the mid-1800s, Christmas was not celebrated by Christians. Catholics, yes, uh, but, but Baptists and Protestants didn't celebrate, for the most part, didn't celebrate Christmas. And going back before that, back in, in the early um, settlements, back in, in um, Massachusetts, it was, there was a law on the books, and I've got a quote in the, in the um, outline I did on Christmas. I did on Christmas. There was a law on the books that said that people would be fined, I think it was five shillings, for celebrating Christmas. It was illegal in that town to celebrate Christmas. Now, why was this? Is it because they were all a bunch of anti-Christian atheists? No, it's because they were Christians or professing Christians anyway. They were Christians and they knew that this stuff was pagan and they did not want to allow it in this country. Now, the whole country is obsessed with it, right? Everybody gets the Christmas spirit. Think about that. The Christmas spirit. What is the Christmas spirit? It ain't the Holy Spirit, I can tell you that much. The Christmas spirit is that spirit that was around when that holiday was first started, like, sun worshiping and paganism and things like that. So you can take a look at many, or many, excelsiorspringschurch.com slash holidays, and I've got a full-length sermon on each of those holidays. Let me check, check the time here. I don't, I'm not going to have enough time. It's almost been an hour, and the, uh, the next section is on closed communion, but that's a, that's a more lengthy one, so... We will get to that next time. Didn't get nearly as far as I thought I would today. But next time we'll pick up with closed communion and then we'll uh, talk about some of our other beliefs and we will eventually make it through this little series here and, and then move on to something else. Thanks for listening.